From the Squamish Chief. This is the Squamish Sound. I'm Keely Bartlett. And I'm Stephen Chua. This is the 20th episode of our weekly podcast. You'll hear the story behind the story as we take you into the newsroom. We'll talk about what did and didn't get into the newspaper this week. On the show today, we're covering our local MP, Pamela Goldsmith-Jones, saying goodbye and offering her take on the upcoming federal election campaign. We talked to some of the potential Green Party candidates on why they think they might be the right choice for the party. And finally, council is leaning towards a more restrictive regulation on short-term, also known as Airbnb-type rentals. So to begin with, um, Pamela Goldsmith-Jones is the current member of parliament for the West Vancouver Sunshine Sea to Sky riding. Last month, she announced a decision not to run for re-election and she gave her farewell speech at the House of Commons. Uh, Keeley has been following uh, the federal election for us at the paper, Mm -hmm. uh, and she just recently talked to Pamela. Um, What did she have to say? So I spoke to Pamela the day after she gave this farewell speech, and we started off with the question that was on everyone's mind. was, why isn't she running for re-election? And she, her answer in short is that she wants to be closer to home for families. She's been a big proponent of trying to have a better balance for members of parliament. She wants for members of parliament to have an extra day in their communities, in their ridings, instead of how the schedule is laid out now. She thinks that they don't need to sit the full Fridays. And so that's probably part of her decision in being closer to home, spending more time in her actual riding with her family, and she said she wants to be closer to her parents. Um, But we reached out to her after this farewell speech to ask her from her shoes, from behind the desk where people are going to be striving to be sitting next fall, what her idea is for this upcoming campaign season, what kind of issues she expects to see, what she hopes to see. Well, I certainly know what I believe our community is going to be interested in. Seniors issues and pharmacare, I think, need to be a priority, and I expect that they will be. I think that, obviously, the Trans Mountain Pipeline is going to be a challenge, and I've knocked on a lot of doors, and I've, I've listened to, obviously, Lots of support, lots of opposition. Both sides, though, talk about what does Canada's energy future look like? How do we transition away from uh, the status quo? Um, What is the energy mix? What promise does technology hold? How can we do a better job working with Indigenous and non-Indigenous business together? And so, to me, and I said, I've talked about this in my speech, we have to improve in terms of talking about the issue of energy and clean energy beyond are you pro or con a pipeline. That's not really helping with where we, we need to go. People are concerned about the way we do politics. There's going to be concern about fake news. There's going to be concern about even things like electoral tampering. And to me, the antidote to all of that is to be engaged to actually get to know candidates, get to know the priorities of the community, articulate them to politicians, because you can't be fooled by fake news if you know what the reality actually is. And then she also has some advice for whoever is the next member of parliament for the West Vancouver Sunshine Coast Sea to Sky riding. So let's tune in. Well, whoever is next, I will always be here to support. I would say you really have to get out in the community. So you need to be rested. You need to eat properly. It is a big amount of territory to cover. And it's not just for the election. It's for four years. Um, Make that effort because the community will support the presence and the access. It's so important. Um, and, And not to take that for granted. So Pam does still have four more months as the member of parliament for our riding, and she is planning on spending a lot of time back here with her constituents, continuing to work, of course. And I did ask her what she thinks she'll do after this fall when she's no longer the member of parliament, and she said that she's not really thinking that far ahead right now because she wants to give her full attention to the task at hand. Hmm. 
Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks for that update. But that wasn't the only piece of federal election news that you were working on. No. So let's talk about the current players in this campaign. So, so far, there is only one confirmed candidate for our riding, mm-hmm. and that is the Conservative Party's Gabrielle Loren. Jen interviewed her last month, and you can hear more about what she had to say about running for the election in that interview. But for this episode of the podcast, we're talking about the Green Party. They have yet to put forward a candidate because they are currently hosting these internal voting sessions for their members to try to choose between two candidates. So they're called nominational contesters. Mm -hmm. So there are two of them. There's Lars Guignard and Dana Taylor. Okay. And we spoke to both of them for this issue. Okay, perfect. Um, so I guess we'll be hearing from both the candidates about you know their elevator pitches on mm-hmm. why they think they're going to be the right ones. Um, I guess just to give like a, a quick backgrounder on this, uh, is there just like a, a really like a Coles Notes version of like who these guys are? Yes. Yeah. So basically, Lars is the newest face. So he doesn't have political experience, but he does think that that's one of his strong suits. Okay. And then for Dana Taylor, he might be a little more familiar, especially to those who are interested in conservation of how sound. So Lars told me that he actually graduated from McGill. He is originally from BC, but after graduating from McGill, he moved on to LA, Los Angeles, hmm. Hollywood, wow. to pursue a career in film and television and so he was a screenwriter for a while and then when he had kids he didn't really want to raise them down there and he decided to move back home and he is most interested it seems in the climate change issue Mm -hmm. and so we'll talk to him a little bit about why he chose the green party and why being new to politics is good I think the big thing about me is I'm not really an environmentalist. I think I want to label myself a realist. I joined this because we have a crisis that we're facing here, and I have kids, and I'm concerned. The big point I want to make is that this is this has gone beyond politics, these environmental issues that we face. And I think it's time that regular people started taking an interest. I'm one of those regular people. I'm not a politician. I'm a little rough around the edges. That's something that I'm not ashamed of. And I think it's ultimately important that you don't need to be a politician to run. I think you just need to realize that it's time to stand up. And it's important that people run for political office, people who have no ties to any kind of special interest group or anything along those lines. And I think the Green Party is showing and is demonstrating that it's no longer a a fringe institution. So when I started to see that, I saw the potential there to actually provoke and create change. And I I think the Green Party can be a big part of that. They're the most on point of the parties right now in terms of addressing climate crisis, actually doing something about it, not just saying they're going to do something about it. So Lars said that, coming back to his kids again, is that even his daughter is one of the many young students who have been involved in these global climate strikes. And so he's seen firsthand the kind of impact that our environmental situation is having on our children, on the future of our country and our world, I suppose. And so he has an idea about what the industry can do to help the climate change situation. Industry left unchecked has a fiduciary responsibility to its shareholders, essentially. So we have a situation where a big oil company will extract a profit, but they're not paying the full price for that because they're polluting the airshed. So I think if we had a situation where they actually had to pay the full price, and then they would pivot their business model in such a direction that it made economic sense. So working with industry essentially means that we need we need to incentivize them to do good things and take away their ability to, to do bad things. But it's more of a carrot than a stick approach. So let's go over to Dana Taylor. He is somebody that people in the sea to sky might recognize. He has a background in both being a resident, working in the construction industry, and government. And so let's take a listen to what he has to say about what he hopes that experience will bring to the table for this election. I was active in the the original cleanup of How Sound many years ago. I felt that as I looked into the proposal itself for the LNG plant that 
this was a, uh, something that would seem to be counter to the interests of the evolution of the sound, which has been more towards uh, other types of industry, particularly around uh, recreation, uh, ecotourism possibilities and the like. And the frankly, the proposal for the sound uh, the, was not conducive to that. So during the last provincial election, discovered that at the time they didn't have a candidate, uh, I looked into it and I, I felt that uh, I'm as qualified in some ways as many, so I jumped in with both feet, you might say. <laughs> I have experienced both lobbying on behalf of industry. I come from an industry, industry background, the construction industry in British Columbia. I've worked on numerous pieces of legislation that are generally geared to improve the standards for industry in whatever area that might happen to be. Specifically, I've worked on something called prompt payment legislation. I've worked on contractor licensing, uh, trades training initiatives, uh, various things. I, I have been construction gives me uh, has given me access and knowledge of a lot of what goes on in terms of preparing for employment, uh, specifically trades training in the, in the construction field. So uh, the the I guess what I'm saying is that many of these many of these topics are familiar to me already from that from that experience, uh, and uh, so. I won't have perhaps as quite a steep a learning curve as others uh, when I'm actually uh, active in office. Um, and the experience is, is one from very much from uh, both a consumer and a user of government's point of view and from a constituency level. You may also know that I served on city council in North Vancouver many years ago. So I've, I've actually experienced governing uh, from that perspective as well. So... As we just heard, Dana has actually run for the Green Party before. He was in the race for the BC legislature in 2017. He came in second place, but he's hoping that that learning experience, as he calls it, will help him in this current election season. And let's talk to him about why he believes the Green Party is the right one. The fact of the matter is the Green Party is the only one that's active in any way, shape, or form in taking serious steps to mitigate the, the larger issues of um, climate change, climate crisis, while the others all dance around about it. The Green Party is the only one that actually has a plan to do something differently. I think it's very much consistent with the views that I've acquired over time uh, and, um, and and very much the realization that uh, the major parties, none of them can easily make change. They're too caught up in the, their traditional allegiances, whether it be corporate, oil, so we also asked Dana what he thinks are some issues that people in Squamish and the rest of the riding will be interested in this season. So we'll see if that matches up with what the current MP, Pamela Goldsmith-Jones, said earlier. Issues that, to me, have remained the same uh, for much of the corridor, that their transportation, access to transportation, both public and roadways. Housing continues to be a concern uh, that's voiced universally everywhere, but specifically uh, in in areas like Squamish for the North too, in the Worcester area. So those kind of linger as things that the federal government may or may not be able to address depending on uh, how those are approached. The provincial election was a learning experience for me in terms of when you live in an area, and it's a general area, and, uh, you, you have a feel for the place, but do you know it? I tell you, you don't know a place until you compete for a position in government. And you have all the issues dumped on you, put in front of you and said, okay, now do something about it. I feel a far greater link to the, both the Squamish and the issues that impact Squamish, having had that experience. And, I, and that, in turn, has tuned me into, uh, I would think, being a better representative of, of the area uh, if we want to get elected. All right. So both of those candidates, Lars and Dana, will be at the ledge on Tuesday, June 18th. For the final session of when they will be chosen by members of their party. And we should be finding out next week which one of them is successful. And uh, with that being said, we're going to take it over to our editor's pick, where we bring in our editor, Jennifer Thuncher. She's going to tell us what, in her mind, is the topic of the week. You're bringing me in. Yes. Okay. Always. So Airbnb was discussed at council. You wrote about this. Mm -hmm. So help me and our listeners understand. I own my own place okay. under the zoning or under the rule they're they're considering. Yep. 
Number C. Letter C. Option C. Option C. Option C. What can I do? Okay, so you can uh, rent out. You can put in one like Airbnb style rental per property uh, mm-hmm. that you have, but you can only do it on the property that you live on full time. You have to prove that you are the primary resident. That's what they call it. Uh, you cannot, um, for example, buy a, a whole bunch of houses and rent them all out. You can only have uh, so like there's the, the 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 term for that is no investment properties are allowed. So if you don't live in these properties, if you have them because you're speculating on the real estate market or because you want to you know create your own a house hotel empire not gonna happen <laughs> so basically that's what you can do uh, and as far as what you can't do you can't rent it out to secondary suites you cannot rent out coach houses and the reasoning for that is they want those uh, things to be basically saved up for long-term rent the, the likely uh, options that that will leave you is to either uh, let's say if you own a house you stick them in a room in your house or an apartment uh, you stick them in a room in your apartment <laughs> or if, um, let's say, you are leaving for your own vacation or you're out of town for whatever reason, you can let them just have the whole thing to themselves. And right. then when you come back, then you, you kick them out. Right. Yep. Which I wouldn't do because I don't take a vacation. But, oh, that's right. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's have a listen to um, what Mayor Karen Elliott had to say about this. The problem I have with just regulating this is that we need to look at incentives, incentives for long-term rentals. So right now... If I have a legitimate secondary suite that I uh, provide to a long-term renter, I pay two utility bills. If I am doing an Airbnb, I am am not doing that. Uh, So so I think we need to look at all the rules and regulations we've put around long-term rentals and see if we can flip that equation a little bit because we know the return uh, based on a lot of letters is higher if you're short-term renting. So what can we do to bring maybe the cost down and make it more of an incentive for long-term renters? So that's one thing I think we should look at as we bring this regulation forward. Interesting. I hadn't thought about the utility bill issue before, Mm -hmm. but it it makes some sense. And it's interesting to think about how in Squamish it's a middle class, lower class, I don't know if lower is sort of, it's it's a class divide that we haven't seen before. I don't remember this ever being in any of the communities I lived in actually prior to obviously Airbnb being popular where we have these people are middle class for the most part, I would say, who mm-hmm. are renting out for Airbnb. And then it's the the people who can't afford to find rents here mm-hmm. that are the ones that are suffering. So it's an interesting divide. And there's did they say 500 units that they, they could count on on these vacation rental sites? So yeah, at, at the moment, the current count is about 500 that are up uh, for rent. These are unique postings. Um, so uh, for example, if you post like, a, like, I don't know, four different things on like four, you post a room four times on four different sites, they only count one because that's a unique Right. Um, so that's that's 500 so actual that's pretty accurate then. yeah exactly and it, it's definitely something that impacts all of us i don't know if you and i ever discussed this but when i first came up here and was doing freelance i wanted to find a long-term rental and i could not yeah and i um lived in i don't want to say it was airbnb it could have been home away i don't want to target one of them i can't remember but it was two thousand dollars basically <sighs> having to staying in an airbnb and i had to leave every i think five or six days because they had other people coming in but that was my only option if i wanted to work in this corridor so it's it's a reality for a lot of people um let's talk about enforcement what did doug race have to say there is never a business case around this <laughs> it just won't exist um it, it, it will never work but but i think if we put money aside in the budget uh and choose carefully with some offenders uh, word will get out. Yeah, basically, um, what he means by that is, yes, uh, enforcement. I mean, like prior to that, to put it in a little bit more context, Karen was um, Mayor Karen Elliott was <laughs> Mayor was looking, Elliott. <laughs> Mayor Elliott was it was going into a bit more detail, saying, "Hey, we need a business case for this. How much is it going to cost? Um, I want to see some numbers, and if it doesn't really add up to what I want, I might change my mind into perhaps." Uh, I guess implying a less restrictive option that doesn't require as many mm. uh, bylaw officers on the ground just you know handing out tickets for this kind of thing. But Doug was of the mind that, hey, well, you know what? Um, we don't necessarily need a whole fleet of bylaw officers. You see a few high-profile examples 
uh, you make an example out of them and everyone else will fall in line fall in line exactly Tofino reminds me a bit of Squamish it's a uh, as most people know it's a popular tourist and surfing location on Vancouver Island where I grew up mm-hmm. um, and so they have not as restrictive as what's proposed in Squamish but they've done some interesting things that maybe the municipality would think about so they've issued seven, 65 it says on their website uh, tickets just in 2017 mm. that's the latest date they had on their website and they also list publicly all of the accepted or the ones that had business license all the accepted um vacation rentals so you can go on there and see who's got the legit ones right which was interesting so there's lots of i guess different scenarios that could be used for enforcement slash incentive i guess Mm -hmm. we'll have to wait and see what the backlash is and if council sticks to this one all right well thanks jen ciao The Squamish Sound is brought to you by The Squamish Chief. The music for this episode was produced by Stephen Chua, cover photo by Clayton Matthews. Have a story tip? Give us a call at 604-892-9161. Send an email to news at squamishchief.com. You can read these stories and more online at squamishchief.com, the newspaper, and have the news delivered to your door every week.